Are you a ham and want to operate digital modes? Today it's done with sound cards, but it wasn't always that way. Let's take a look at the noisy history of digital signals on the air. Welcome to Ask Dave, episode 46. I'm Dave Kassler, amateur radio call sign KE0OG, answering your questions about amateur radio. HF Digital these days revolves around the so-called sound card modes. But let's look at some history to better understand why and how. Sometimes understanding history helps us better understand the present. First, let's skip the argument about whether CW is a digital mode. It well predates anything we might call digital today. CW is not well suited for machine interpretation so over a hundred years ago, along came teleprinters, both in the USA and in Europe. Well, once teletype machines became available to amateur radio operators after World War II, ways were found to put these on the air. Each teletype machine had a TU, or terminal unit, that would convert the on-off mark space keying of the TTY machine into tones that could be fed to a radio transmitter to create radio teletype or RIDI. The method used was frequency shift keying, just like as was used by the military during World War II. The signal would be one frequency for the mark and another for the space. After a few years of experimentation, the tone spacing for ham radio settled on 170 hertz, and for many years this was the only truly digital mode to be found in ham radio. RIDI was often found near 14.080 MHz and is there to this day. I can remember reading article after article about TUs that would send and receive RIDI signals. At one point, I actually owned a Teletype Model 15 and found a receive-only TU and then created a very rudimentary frequency shift keyer that I mounted on the lid from a can. I had a grand total of one QSO with a very patient ham. When the internet came along, hams were in on the act early. Packet radio became a thing on VHF, particularly on two meters. As it turns out, a very positive article about HF packet in QST led me to purchase an AEA PK232, even though it was rather expensive. The PK232 is a classic modem. Bits and bytes go in one end, and tones for the radio come out the other end, and vice versa. Well, I quickly learned that HF packet was, and I might add remains, a bust. The noisy HF channel is not suitable for long, easily corrupted packets. So I figured out how to use the PK232 for ready. Now, this was a major breakthrough. The PK232 and the computer were completely interoperable with stations running the classic TU and noisy TTY machines. One day I was talking with another very patient ham on RIDI who talked me through the process of using the PK232 for AMTOR. AMTOR is an error-free digital mode that involves a rapid-fire give-and-take between two stations. AMTOR was exceptionally popular because it was definitively better error-wise than RIDI. Then someone came along with Pactor. Pactor combines the longer packets of packet radio to degree along with error detection and correction schemes. People moved away from Amtor in droves because Pactor allowed both upper and lower case letters and was very reliable, plus it was much easier on transmitters. For a long time, the only signals you heard between 14.060 and 14.070 whole megahertz were Pactor. Now, and this is important, the computer is doing nothing more than processing ASCII characters that are sent to and received back from the PK232 or a similar multimode data controller. But as time went on, computers became more and more capable. Then along came a mode called PSK31. In this mode, 
instead of using frequency shift keying to switch back and forth between two frequencies, the mode would shift back and forth between phases of a constant frequency signal. By the way, the form of modulation used has a nominal bandwidth of 31 hertz, hence the name phase shift keying dash 31. From the earliest times, PSK-31 used the computer sound card as the modem. The reason is because a sound card is sort of a computer unto itself. Each has a powerful signal processor chip. Tinkerers discovered that it had uses far beyond recording or playing music. In fact, any arbitrary waveform could be created, plus any arbitrary incoming waveform could be interpreted. The very earliest PSK-31 pioneers used exceptionally finicky software, but then DigiPan came along. This was a revolutionary new way to drive a sound card that made tuning drop dead easy. Since Pactor signals pretty much used up the band from 14060 to 14070, PSK operations settled into the region of 14.070 to 14.073, where it remains today. Well, note that no expensive external modem was needed between the computer and the radio. You could simply attach sound cables between the computer and the radio, plus usually software used the ubiquitous RS-232 port for switching between transmit and receive. I built my own PTT interface box, consisting of a connector to the computer's RS-232 jack, a 2N2222 transistor, and the radio's push-to-talk circuit. I connected the audio directly between the computer and the radio. It worked, and I had dozens and even hundreds of PSK-31 contacts. It became immediately apparent that connecting computer audio to radio audio was often difficult because of loudness differences, impedance differences, and ground loops. So, companies such as West Mountain Radio quickly came out with interfaces, often consisting of no more than audio isolation transformers and a way to convert the RS-232 to push-to-talk. These became exceptionally popular, and PSK-31 use exploded. At the same time, inventive hams realized that the sky was the limit as regards digital modes. With the same basic setup, many different modes could be used. With the large amount of processing power available on a computer sound card, and now a great deal of computer central processing power, exotic error correction schemes can be made to work. And likewise, it wasn't long before RIDI could be done using a sound card instead of an expensive external terminal unit. Pactor would have been next, but Pactor 2, 3, and 4 are actually proprietary modes, so Pactor has never been available as a sound card mode. The reluctance to open source the Pactor protocol has meant that Pactor has all but disappeared from HF, and if you tune across the once busy range of 14.060 to 14.070 megahertz, you won't hear much. But even in the PSK31 hysteria, there were some drawbacks. Any sound coming out of the sound card was sent to the radio for transmission, including the bleeps and bloops normal to windows. You had to remember to turn the windows sounds off before operating one of these new modes. Further, more and more computers came without an RS-232 port, making push-to-talk difficult. And then came the next revolutionary step around about 2006. A company called Tigertronics came out with a device that interfaced the computer to the radio. What was unique is that the device, called the Signalink USB, has an actual sound card inside. The only interface with the computer is a USB cable. Along with the Signalink, you can get a cable that will work with your radio. One key advantage is that the signal link looks to Windows like a second sound card. So Windows and music could use the sound card built in 
and digital mode software would see the second sound card. So you could get all the settings right and then leave them alone. The signal link has handy knobs for managing levels and complete audio isolation helps prevent ground loops. It was and remains a remarkable device. The signal link now has several competitors, but often they're rather more expensive. I've used my signal link for years. Well, now to the next innovation that brings us up to date. Given that RS-232 ports have long disappeared from computers, radio manufacturers have somewhat begrudgingly installed USB connections. My Yesu FTDX3000 is an example of a radio that provides both a USB and an RS-232 connection. But with USB going directly into the transceiver, it was a short leap for manufacturers to install a sound card right in the radio. As it turns out, and this surprised me because it's not in the radio's manual, but my FTDX3000 happens to be one such transceiver. So now my signal link is in a closet along with my old 10 Tech Jupiter, and the only connector between my computer and radio is the USB cable. Given the ubiquity of the sound card radio interface, new digital modes seem to pop up daily. No one develops digital modes that need specialized external hardware, so boxes like the PK232, although still available, have faded from view. The only mode for which you need a data controller is Pactor 3 and 4, and those modes are used on HF now for special purposes only and require a very expensive, over $1,000, proprietary data controller. Everything else is sound card oriented. If you work one sound card mode, you can, in theory, work them all. For example, Slow Scan TV has been reoriented to sound cards. Exotic old hardware modes such as Hellschreiber are sound card enabled. Even Morse code can be sent and, to a degree, received using sound cards. Nobel laureate Joe Taylor, K1JT, created his low power modes JT65 and JT9 to use sound cards. So, there you have it. A short history of the sound card and its use in amateur radio. Find out if your HF radio has a built-in sound card. It might. I think all the recent entrants into the marketplace seem to. Take the time to figure out how to connect your radio for HF digital modes. Ask Dave episode 25 discusses setting up for digital modes and Ask Dave 26 describes setting up FL Digi. Ask Dave 41 talks about JT65. It's a fun digital world out there. Please click like, please click subscribe. Check out the Ask Dave playlist. Check out the tip jar. Don't run with scissors. Leave a comment, ask a question. Till next time, 73.